Dr. Williams, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today. I'm going to talk about a few things, but uh, along the way, you know, this is most interesting uh, if you raise your hand and ask questions along the way. What you really don't want to hear me is be up here, and my, my associates will attest to this, is have me be up here and talk to you for 50 minutes. A um, couple things. Um, you know, Dr. Williams talked about who I am. Um, well, let me tell you, I, I, it seems, doesn't seem like that long ago, I guess, but it was a, a real long time ago that I was kind of in, in your same boat here. So, you know, my background is one where um, I went to community college to start off. A um, couple of years there, working my way, so school during the day, work in the afternoon. Uh, went on to Cleveland State, likewise, uh, worked commuted, uh, worked in the afternoon. And so, you know, first of all, uh, you, you're at a wonderful college. You know, so Elizabethtown, you've got a great setting, you've got great instructors. Uh, so take advantage of what is here. You know, it's, uh, it's very tempting, you know, believe me, it's very tempting for me on a beautiful day and a week like this to do other things. But, you know, keep, keep what's focused in mind, you know, as, as you go forward. So um, with that, I, you know, I had worked uh, through things, um, uh, worked through college at a bank, didn't really realize I was going to go into banking. I originally started off as a chemical engineering student. Uh, so for me, you know, it was uh, going down that route. Um, but I think the fundamentals, whether it be banking, finance, uh, engineering, there's a lot of overlap in terms of things. So, you know, I'm, I'm very focused uh, with my kids. I've got 23-year-old twins, or my youngest kids, about making sure that everybody learns the fundamentals because no matter if you're business, accounting, economics, entrepreneurship, marketing, the fundamentals are what's going to carry you going forward. So, and, and things transcend so much. So when I thought, oh, geez, my year of engineering prep was kind of wasted, well, not so much. You know, the, the calculus, the statistics, the, the programming, this, the thought process transcends. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, I've been in your shoes, shoes, learn as much as you can. Sometimes you're going to wonder what you learn if it's applicable. Um, you know, have a little trust, learn, learn it. Uh, I, I guarantee you at some point, in fact, it is. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough uh, to um, work for uh, Bank One, which became part of J.P. Morgan Chase when I was going to school. And had a very good start there. Um, and, but, you know, it's, I, I wanted more. So I, I actually was, uh, worked for the Federal Reserve System for almost 10 years in my career early on. Initially as a regulator. Uh, so when you hear all these bad things about banks, I was a regulator back in the mid to uh, late 80s and into the 90s. And actually, there was another financial crisis back then in terms of a whole bunch of banks went, went under. And um, I won't say as much as it was a pleasure, but it was a great learning experience to be involved with a whole bunch of financial institutions at that point to really learn a little bit more about what they did. So breadth of experience, so forth. Um, with regard to after that for me is that I was lucky enough to, when I went to get my MBA, uh, Case Western Reserve's Weatherhead School, is I was able to mesh, at that point I was more into policy work with the Fed, I was able to mesh the two together. So that was very lucky on my part to be able to do that. It was just a great experience. Um, went on to work for National City Corporation that was headquartered in Cleveland. Uh, did a, many, many things for them. And uh, ultimately, I was a, a regional president for uh, National City back uh, early 2000s. Um, had done a lot of mergers and acquisitions for them as well. And ultimately, um, uh, subsequently, PNC purchased Nat City back in 2008 during the financial crisis. So I know what it's like to lead a financial institution when you don't know all the details and lead people when you're in crises and you don't know all the answers and you got to keep your chin up and you got to keep focused in day to day. So, you know, certainly at any point along the line, if anyone wants to ask about what it was like to be in the financial institution or lead people during that point in time, you know, please, please ask me. Um, so that was a really, really interesting time in terms of uh, what the world was. Uh, thankfully, I work for a great and very solid institution now in PNC Bank. I've been in my role today since 2011. I had been a regional president for PNC in Southwest Ohio, and they asked me to come here in 2011. I think, as you all know, whether, you, whether you've lived here or moved to the area, I mean, it's, it's a really cool place. It's a, it's a wonderful 
a combination of uh, you know, restored colonial cities like Lancaster uh, that's been able to keep its rural roots and whether it be uh, uh, also cultural, you know, the Amish Mennonite influence, but it's also a great industrial hub as well and agribusiness in this area is just really wonderful. So for my job today, what I do is I manage uh, primarily all our lines of business, our retail, commercial, wealth management business, and, and frankly I spend most of my time either on management of my own folks, cultivating commercial industrial business, and or do an awful lot of civic activity. Dr. Williams referenced, I sit on eight boards today and a couple more at the state level in terms of advisory groups. So a lot of things going on there, transcend health care to everything from the branding of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that was just released. I was working on that task force. So a lot of good things happening there. Uh, just going to spend a minute or two talking about you know, who and what the company is I work for. I won't spend a huge amount of time on this, but I do work for PNC Corporation. Um, you, know, you may see a PNC <coughs> around in terms of branches. You may even see them more because we're in every Sheets, every Wawa, every Turkey Hill around in terms of ATMs. Um, but what we really operate in 19 different states in terms of our re retail franchise. Uh, we're headquartered in Pittsburgh. Uh, people are going to, you know, either now or else is going to say, what the, what the heck does PNC stand for? Well, it was kind of a convenient comp uh, uh, compromise on a name when Pittsburgh National Corp, which was Pittsburgh National Bank, merged with Provident National in Philadelphia to become Pennsylvania's largest bank. They both had corporate initials of PNC, and so that's where the PNC came from. So uh, that's why we're called what we are. We are a pretty significantly sized institution. We're in excess of $350 billion of assets. So the orange here is where our retail franchise is. The blue is where we do business, and mostly on the corporate and industrial side. Um, and we also have uh, payment systems processing in 10 different locations throughout the US, as well as up in Toronto. Uh, you'll see to the right there, we also have presence in London and Shanghai. So um, everything we do internationally is not to go get international business, but is to support the domestic businesses who are going to be doing business internationally. And I think you're finding that from your classes or otherwise, that more and more this is a pretty global world out there. Got my notes here, which I'm sure I will, I always have notes and I always ignore them. Um, once again, we are the seventh largest bank in the United States. You know, there's the four very large institutions in, in no particular order, Citi, B of A, J.P. Morgan, and Wells Fargo. And then you have the next cluster of names that will include uh, BNY Mellon, which is primarily an asset management payment processing bank, uh, U.S. Bank Corp, which is headquartered out of Minneapolis, and then PNC. So we're all kind of grouped in that three to four hundred billion dollar range. You know, pretty big numbers actually. Uh, and then you begin to move down some of the other names you may see in the area. Uh, BB&T is new to the market here. Uh, they're 10th. Uh, let's see, M&T is 15th in the country. Some other names you may see. But PNC is a very, very significant uh, size institution in the country. What we do, um, and this is going to be too small for you to read, I think, but except for maybe the headings. Retail banking, what you would all expect in terms of retail banking, your, your checking accounts, your credit cards. Um, uh, everything that goes with that. More and more, we're also becoming a very much of a financial consultant on the wealth side. So we're, a we're asking our, our people to do more and more and be more, less about transactors at the branch and more, more um, knowledge brokers. Um, our asset management group, um, we manage well in excess of $100 billion overall as a company. My little world in here in central Pennsylvania, which is for me, Everything from Reading to Lancaster over to State College, Altoona, Harrisburg, York, and upriver into Williamsport. You know, we manage just shy of uh, two billion dollars of, of of money here in in, in my group. Uh, corporate institutional bank. Um, this is where I spend the bulk of my time. This is dealing with both publicly and privately held uh, companies, as well as healthcare and hospital systems, colleges and universities, um, public. Uh, entities. It could be anything from uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it could be uh, municipalities, locally, counties, so forth. And uh, really on this front, it's everything from the credit and capital that they need 
to the payment systems um, that they also require and will actually go and do bond underwriting uh, through my licensed capital market folks as well. Uh, residential mortgage is something that we've, uh, we're pretty big in. Um, probably have about uh, six or 7,000 people dedicated to this in terms of servicing. This is what got the whole world uh, obviously in a mess back in 08. I should say up front, whenever I talk about industry or comments here, my words, not necessarily my companies, we are a publicly traded company, so if I start getting into specifics of what I think is cause, cause of things, I'll tell you what I think, but they're, they're mine. Uh, they're, not they're not the company's uh, viewpoints. Um, and lastly, um, you'll see BlackRock up there. I don't know if many of you know the name BlackRock, which is the largest publicly traded asset manager in the world. PNC happens to own 22% of BlackRock. So, you know, if you ever look at our earnings during the course of the year, um, you know, there's an incremental income line uh, that comes from our friends uh, Larry, Larry Fink and the folks over at BlackRock. So that is a, that's been a great partnership for us. It's something we've had even a larger stake in the past. Uh, from those of you in accounting of what you can and will find out, you know, I don't know what we do with this because, you know, if we begin to liquidate some, some or all of it, there's huge tax consequences. And frankly, it, it's, it's a great partnership in terms of sharing some of the resources and certainly a great uh, revenue provider for PNC. One of the things culturally we as a company are very strong about is our being a good corporate citizen. Uh, and that comes from everything from working on community development to help low and mod income folks uh, have a good place to live, working with the tools that we may have like historic tax credits, new market tax credits, working on a whole bunch of education uh, the VITA program, or, uh, uh, which is tax preparation or income tax, or, uh, 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 earned income tax credits, all sorts of those things. We spend a, a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of money working with the community because we know how important it is just to have a vibrant place, let alone our corporate responsibility. Charitable giving, um, we give a lot of money away. We don't just give it away, but we have certain filters we run it through. Our main filters are economic development and early childhood education, which I'll speak about in a moment. But once again, is that there is a corporate responsibility not only for who and what we are, whether it be Community Reinvestment Act or otherwise, um, but the conscience of our company as well as the employee base. I think more and more individuals want to work for a company that they, that they can feel really good about. And uh, you know, all of our testing and scores, and we don't do it specifically because of this, really show that our employees at, at PNC, you know, 55,000 plus strong, really feel good about working for our company. Environmental responsibility, I think this fact still holds, is that we have built more LEED certified new buildings than any other company in the world. We adopted this practice 10 years ago and um, uh, it became very important to us environmentally, energy savings wise, you know, and if you get a little byproduct of goodwill from it, all the better, and your employees feel good about things. One of the really big things we do is um, committed to is, is called PNC Grow Up Great. And this was our former chairman, Jim Rohr, uh, advances probably, I don't even know if the year is in here, uh, 2004. At that point, it was a $250 million 10-year program to focus on having kids from underserved areas, low modding, income kids be ready to go to school. You know, we saw early on that this is where the biggest return on investment was. And so we focused on this and committed $250 million to do this. Since it's been extended for another $100 million to $350 million. So this is a, something that we, in terms of philanthropy, in terms of volunteer efforts of our, our, our people, in terms of partnerships in the community, we're very, very strong, strongly about. To, to help kids succeed, and we know the way to do that is to help them be as prepared as possible. Uh, we do this in many fronts. One of the more fun things is because of our partnership with Sesame Workshop. So, you know, I just was at a function two weeks ago where we had Elmo at it and a thousand kids. So, you know, real Elmo, about this high out there, and, uh, you know, you gotta, get the, you gotta get a draw. And so the kids all came for Elmo. We were able to give their families kind of training and education packets 
and, and talk to them a little bit about their caregiver, whether it be mom, dad, grandma, aunt, next door neighbor, whatever the case may be. What can you do to help the kids work with them? And we're giving them materials uh, to, help, uh, to help them be prepared for school. And clearly we work an awful lot with the, we don't pretend to be the experts or educators with this, but we work an awful lot with to give resources and share resources with those who do. And lastly, we, we really do ask our folks to volunteer quite a bit, and we will actually give them 40 uh, paid hours a year to volunteer uh, for approved areas. So it's, it's very important to us in terms of, of who we are culturally in terms of giving back to the community. Um, I'm going to shift. That's gonna, that's, I'll go back to this, and I'll leave that up there a second. That's all the slides I'm going to have for you today. And, but what I did want to talk to you about is a couple things. I want to talk to you about the banking environment, my industry, give you a little bit of sense of what's going on there. Uh, and then more than anything else, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I see in terms of any guidance or interaction we can have in terms of your careers. What I see, what I see works well for folks, what I see as challenges, uh, and just little tidbits and hopefully have some conversation on that front. From the banking environment, it's a very challenging environment out there. So I'll throw a couple things out there. It's going to touch on um, economics or, or finance. Um, but what makes it such a challenging um, uh, environment for banking these days is really a few things. One is that there's a flat yield curve. You guys know what a yield curve is yet? OK. Uh, yield curve is, look what shows interest rates. So when you see the kind of the curve of interest rates from short term overnight cost of borrowing to upwards of like what a 10 year treasury bond would be in all the interim periods, that's a yield curve. In the banking environment, when you have a flat yield curve, um, cost of long term money isn't, isn't that much more than, than short term money. And what do banks do? Banks take in money from the general public and the retail sector generally pay deposits. And if you have a deposit account or your parents do or somebody else does, you know you're not making a lot of money on it. And then they take that money and they lend it out uh, to individuals and to companies. Well, when that rate environment is very flat, the differential between the money you lend out and the money you pay in deposits isn't very much. Well, that's really what banks make money on. So for the most part, if that's very small, they have to do all their operations, build the buildings, pay their employees, pay for a whole bunch of information systems with the differential. So when that's flat, there's a lot of earnings pressure for banks. Um, second, with everything that we saw coming out of 2008, 2009, I'm sure you heard that there was a little bit of a financial crisis. Um, there was an awful lot of regulations put in place incrementally. Now, I'm an ex-regulator, so there's always been regulations. Um, but the, uh, coming out of uh, Dodd-Frank and many other uh, different things, there's been a whole bunch more regulations. One says that there's more capital required, which is kind of your insulation for losses. And there's also a, a whole bunch more liquidity required. So I'll just ask the question. If, so if, you know, in terms of finance or otherwise, do, do people know what return on equity is here, or ROE? Is that a concept that's familiar to you? If not, it will be, uh, being in business students. Uh, that means how much income you have relative to how much equity you have in a business. So a as a business, you want to have pretty high, high ROE. So if you're looking at publicly traded companies, those with high ROE, ROEs and with growth are going to have a lot higher stock price than those that don't. So when you have, you know, numerator, a certain amount of income, and you have a whole bunch of more capital in the denominator, your return on equity with given the same level of income uh, with more capitals means your ROE is going to be less. So when public, most banks are um, publicly traded, so they're having an awful lot of earnings pressure relative to the capital. One other thing that's being required, not such a bad thing, is increased liquidity. Um, financial crisis again. Um, anybody ever hear of Lehman's, Lehman Brothers and Lehman Brothers failing? I hope you did, because that was a critical crisis moment back in 08 and 09, and oftentimes you got to know, understand a little bit of history so you, so you make sure you don't repeat it, right? Um, Lehman Brothers failed less because of capital 
than it was because of liquidity, which means they couldn't open up and operate the next day because nobody would fund them. They didn't have enough cash coming in the door, and you'll, also, you'll all find out how important cash is to come in the door. Well, there's all sorts of testing now to say you have to have more liquidity. Well, if you have to have more liquidity, more capital, there's actually less of your funds going out there to earn money, and actually there's less of your funds going out in the economy to help grow the economy. So there is, there is some issues going on there. But it's a tough environment for banks. Um, I can't, you know, banks themselves are hiring far more people in terms of compliance and regulatory compliance and, and risk management than they are marketers these days. So their expenses are going up. Um, and there's also an increased spend on technology for almost everybody. For me, I don't even know where, where I left my phone right now, but I work in a bank and don't go to into a bank. So for me, I do all my banking on, on this thing. You know, I take pictures of the checks I'm going to deposit. If I need cash, I go to an ATM. Uh, I pay my bills online. But, you know, like I say, the first floor of the building I work, there's a branch. I, other than just go and thank my employees and see how they're doing, I don't go into a branch to do transactions. I use a technology. Well, that spend on technology uh, is, is a whole bunch. And protecting against cybercrime and cybersecurity is requiring a whole bunch of bucks. Uh, for my company, between the last three years and I think this year and going into next year, we will have, we will have spent three billion dollars of cash on our technology. Uh, that's a lot of money. And once again, it's all about <coughs> capabilities, it's all about security, and it's all about efficiency. And with that, is there a big return? Not really right now because um, people still want a brick and mortar branch. They still want to be able to do the mobile banking. They want to be confident that when they're doing transactions that they're not being hacked and all their privacy information is not going everywhere. So the reality is while we're migrating to where everything becomes more technology driven, we need to provide multiple channels today. <coughs> So that's, those are expenses that are hurting the industry. Um, one of the things that's, I won't say this is a challenge, but it's kind of cool, is that we're really seeing the confluence of banking and IT. Um, right now, where I think PNC wins relative to our competitors in the uh, corporate and institutional space, is we're very, very good at meshing uh, information with technology, with payment systems. So, for example, when we work with healthcare systems, we're the only bank I can think of that's, and I'm going to use another term here you, you may or may not be familiar with, that's HIPAA compliant. So, in healthcare, you have to, all the fine, uh, healthcare institutions have to make sure they're protecting your privacy of your healthcare data. Um, well, one of the things that we're very, very good at is serving as a um, clearinghouse between payers. And the, and the healthcare industry, and capturing all the information so that when a check goes to them, we can help that healthcare industry make sure that all the payments and information are parsed into the right spots for them. Well, we need to be HIPAA compliant in that case, in, in terms of making sure that we're protecting healthcare data as well. But that's just an example of how the industry has changed in terms of we have a lot of programmers, we have a lot of tech people, and these folks are now becoming core and essence of what it means to be a banker. It, it's a far cry from what banking used to be, and it's, it's, it, frankly, it's a, for me, biased. It's a very fascinating, um, very fascinating uh, uh, profession. You know, efficiency and scale is really important in this industry. Uh, I think we're, between earnings pressure and efficiency of scale, for those around here, I think we've seen an awful lot of consolidation in finance. Um, FNB out of the you know, western central part of the state just bought Metro Bank here. Uh, Integrity and S&T Bank just combined. BB&T just bought Susquehanna Bank. BB&T just bought Nat Penn Bank. Why do all these things happen? You know, is it just because there's you know, so much money to be made and you know, the investment bankers are making some money as they pack, uh, pack these things up? But, for the most part, they're happening because of earnings pressure on, the, on the both, sometimes both the buyer and the seller, but clearly on the seller. 
So I think we'll see more consolidation in the banking industry. Um, I think that the, we're not going to see any of the big boys, those four top ones I showed you earlier. They're not going to get any bigger because the regulators aren't going to let them. Um, and for, for banks that are my size at three to four hundred billion, we'll be selective until we buy uh, who we buy because we're not just going to buy branch structure because frankly the world doesn't use branches that much anymore. Um, one point with that, 54 percent of all of our transactions, retail transactions these days, don't use the branch. Um, so over half of all transactions do not use the branch and there's another 20 percent clearly that really don't need to. So as people become more technologically literate, more comfortable with it, that trend's only going to uh, go forward. So, you know, I don't know if you're still going to see the same number of drugstores in every corner, but my guess is you're going to see fewer bank brick and mortars as time goes by. So I'm going to stop there briefly and say, can I answer any questions? I know I threw just a whole bunch of stuff at you. And uh, I know that also because I've worked in this industry more than 30 years, what, what seems natural to me doesn't always come across as natural. So. But can I, can I answer anything about this industry or maybe concerns or questions you may have had in terms of what's going on or maybe what's happened maybe in the last seven or eight years that's driven a lot of things with banking to flow into the economy? Okay. Okay, I get, uh, I get the interest level of my comments so far, so I gotta shift them. A um, couple things. I'm going to steal a little bit about, uh, I, I was the commencement speaker for Penn State Harrisburg. Uh, when I agreed to do it, I didn't realize I was going to be in front of 6,000 people when I did it. But uh, I'm going to steal a couple of my comments from that with regard to uh, uh, talking about just as your careers progress. And so, first of all, um, you know, in my attempt to try to be funny, I was trying to capture and I think these are valid points, the difference between work world and the college world. So, you know, the first of all is that be careful the careers you choose. Don't choose a career just because you think you can make a lot of money. Um, choose a career because it interests you. Try to be objective and choose a career that fits with the essence of who you are. Not that we all can't change a bit. Um, you know, the thought of standing up in front of this group, let alone 6,000 people, would have scared me silly uh, when I was in you know, your age and in, in, in sitting in your spot. We all can change, we all grow. But, I mean, if you're going to be in a sales position and you really don't like calling people or talking with people too much, and there's all sorts of, that's not going to work. Um, trying to be an investment banker when you're trying to keep life balance at 40 hours, guess what? That ain't going to work. I've got a nephew right now who's 24 years old and literally, this is no exaggeration, works 80 hours every week. He makes a lot of money as a 24 year old and has absolutely no time to spend it. So I raise these issues of think through it because, you know, success, there's many definitions of success. Don't let other people's vision of success drive what you do. So success comes in many shapes, many forms. Um, for some it's money, for some it's prestige, for some it's involvement. I think for many it's a sense of relevance and achievement. Uh, it can be for doing good for the community. Don't let your neighbor or the whole concept of I've got to impress somebody drive what success means for you. So it's, if you're going to be happy in life, look for fit and look for what makes you happy. And knowing that, you know, work's work. You get paid for a reason. Um, but on, on the grand scheme of things, you got to make sure that it fits with kind of who you are and your talents. Because you no longer get summers off when you're, when you're in the work world. You don't get spring breaks, winter breaks. Um, you don't get the three months off for summer. You know, if you're working for work and otherwise, it's a grind. But I tell you what, if you pick a nice career, you don't mind the fact that it's all year. You don't mind checking your emails when you're away. 
Uh, you don't mind doing all these things. It, it kind of all fits together. Everybody looks pretty good here, but you know, when you get to the work world, unless you're in Silicon Valley, and I think even less so now, you know, the whole concept of pajama bottoms and flip-flops don't work during the week anymore when you get there. So keep that in mind. Look at the culture of where you're going into and look to fit. Um, you know, for me, I, I get the, uh, the luxury of occasionally putting on the golf shorts and, and taking clients out to play golf. That's a perk of my job. But I think you have to look at everything you do and make sure that you're fitting within the culture that you get involved with. Um, I joke, I have 23-year-old twin boys, so you know, I joke with this. And I said, you're going to have to set your alarm clock. And they came back and said, Dad, you're old. I said, I know, I know. Set your iPhone, OK? Because the work world does start before about 10 AM. And I think that's one of the things I think significantly, um, even just the cultural change. You know, that's why I pick the career that works for you. Pick the people and the culture that works for you. Because you know what? You're going to spend a lot of hours there. And so you know, be happy, I think, is, 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 my, is, my, is, my, main, is my main point. Um, it can be a grind on folks, I, I think, especially coming into the work world. Because especially when you're first starting, you know, 40 hours is going to be your minimum. And it kind of cranking through it all. So you know, oh, I know we have early first, second year here. But as you get older, I mean, you have to build up that endurance a little bit for the work world. Because you're going to at least be doing you know, 40 hours. Um, you also don't get the opportunity to drop or take pass-fail your work assignments. And so, you know, keep that in mind. I, I know you still have a little bit of that flexibility at points in time here, but um, that's a little bit of different too. And I've seen folks who kind of get into stuff in the work world and say, well, this may not be for me. Grind through it. Grind through anything you can for a period of time. You don't have to do it for a lifetime, but you know, you want to you keep your name and your integrity. The wonderful thing is you're not going to be doing as much homework um, you're not going to be writing as many papers. So that's very cool about the work world. Um, but the thing is, you have less tests. That's cool about the work world. But those things you do, all of a sudden they have an impact on your pay, your merit increase, your promotional opportunities. So it's less transparent, but probably more important how you do. So I just I pass that on. Um, realize, and this is probably from my generation, that every one of you is going to be looked on as a tech expert. Whether you are or not, you're going to, just because of your age, you're going to be looked as a tech expert. So, you know, help folks, that help old folks like me out. Um, and I think, you know, the really cool thing is, you, you pretty soon, when you, when you get to that work world, you get paid. That's not such a bad thing. Instead of having to pay for school here, but, you know, as, as I like to say, you'll become pretty keenly aware of taxes at that point. My advice to you, and this is um, in terms of some things of success factors that I've seen myself and otherwise, and just because what I say doesn't mean I've always done, um, is um, my ex-retired CEO, Jim Rohr from PNC, used to say, I've seen smart people succeed, and I've seen not so smart people succeed. But I've never seen lazy people succeed. So I think effort and hard work are really, really important. If there's no, apart from everything else in terms of success, you'll, you'll find someone who kind of wins the lottery in the job every once in a blue moon. But you know, the, you can't, you can't uh, uh, hard work is the key. Pick your passion and the hard work. Um, when you do things, it's all about your integrity. It's all about doing things in a quality and timely manner. It's all about, once you've finished your effort, raising your hand to take on additional work, new assignments, get variety. Early on in your careers especially, get as many as assignments as you can in its broad spectrum. Um, you know, if you're working in a facility that allows you to work an auditor, I was a bank regulator, I went into like uh, 25 different banks a year. You get variety, you look at different things, I think that's really important. I've seen folks come into my shop who I don't, um, who haven't been there that long and are looking for the corner office in, in like a year or two. Realize you've got to learn the fundamentals. So, you know, stuff like this is great in terms of your accounting, your finance, your economics, your other aspects. 
realize you get the fundamentals, become an expert in your, your discipline, and broaden it from there. A um, couple key things. Invest in building relationships. Relationships are so important. Build the relationships in and amongst yourselves here today. Build the relationships with your professors. Um, as you get in the work world, your associates, your bosses, build those relationships. They are the oil that makes your career engine work. They are the, will help you down the road. When problems come with customers, with otherwise, if you've got a relationship so you can work things out. If you haven't worked on building relationships and you have a snafu, um, you know, things get bad really quickly. If you've built relationships amongst peers in the work world, uh, in the business world, in the customers, things just move so, so smoothly. Um, don't be fooled as much by technology. Social media is a wonderful thing. Use it uh, amongst your peers oftentimes. But when you get into the business world, nothing takes the place of a face-to-face -face meeting Nothing takes the place of a phone call directly to somebody. If there is one major pitfall I see of my young associates coming in is it's over-reliance on email. They think that they can type an email, send it off, and all is taken care of. <coughs> Emails are easily misinterpreted. They don't have the personal relationship aspect. You don't see the question on the face or the question, the tone of voice as you talk to somebody or hear it so you can address it. Um, if there's one thing I emphasize to folks, it's one-on-one -on -one personal contact, either in person or, as, as I like to say, is use the, use the uh, talking port part of this mobile device versus the, versus the texting or email portion. Always treat people with respect. Um, First of all, because it's the right thing to do. Secondly, I cannot tell you uh, how many times in my career I've seen rising stars who do wonderful things um, but leave a path in the wake of carnage and all of a sudden, inevitably, it will come back to haunt them. Um, I have seen acquisitions, or excuse me, individuals who have left the bank, said bad things about them, and all of a sudden, funny how that uh, one bank just happened to acquire where they work again. It's just not worth it. Treat people with respect. You know, the world and your careers are a long, take a long time, and they circle back around on things. So realize that uh, it's better to have friends than enemies, and you really have to work hard to make enemies. Don't work that hard to make enemies. And so make those, make those friendships. You're in school right now. So you're investing in yourself. You know, you know, people ask me, where's the best place to invest? You know, I've always been a big fan of large, large cap, high uh, dividend yielding stocks, but the uh, best place to invest is frankly yourself. So you know, you're, right now, you can't keep this in perspective, but not too distant future, you'll be out of here, you're working. Keep investing in yourself. The world's a dynamic place. I mean. You're, most of you are too young to look back too far and see what's really transpired in the last 10 years and have perspective on it. God only knows what will happen in the next 10 years. Fundamentals will stay with you and keep on learning. If there's one thing to be, you know, be intellectually curious and keep on learning. Create a learning profile and passion much like you would in that, you know, exercise program as you go on in life or, you know, I'm not so much on the exercise, I probably should be, but keep on learning. So whether you go for a graduate degree, whether you just read the Wall Street every day, whether you go get a designation of a CFP or a CFA like I did, um, or whether you go and learn a language, and I know I start learning Spanish over here, whether you go learn Mandarin or whether you go learn C++, keep on learning because you know, the world changes and you want to remain relevant with that. Oh, I have to read my comments here because this is, so where's my, I have, anybody know who Jack Welsh is? 
GE CEO, retired, you know, he's kind of a famous manager. Here's Jack Welsh's comment. An organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. That's a company. It's no different for you. So that's, you know, keep investing in yourself. Help others succeed. You heard me talk about relationships. You heard me talk about not making enemies. One of the best ways to do that is each one of you has a very unique talent. I don't know what that is. Hopefully you do, or you'll become more apparent with it, and that's where you'll channel your, your, your energy and resources. Help others. It will help you, it will help the community, it will help the world. Likewise, volunteer. Help the communities through public service or otherwise. Find your areas to volunteer where you can bring your special talents. You know, it'll, it'll help. It'll help you professionally. You'll meet a ton of people who will help your career. You'll feel good about things. It's just a very virtuous circle. I got to read my MLK quote on this one. You know, we are prone to judge success by the index of our salaries or the size of our automobiles rather than by the quality of our service and our relationship to humanity. You heard me talk earlier about success. What does success mean? It should mean something unique to you. I'm telling you that the volunteer efforts, the giving back, will not only help the community and help your own success factor, inevitably it's going to help your careers because you're just going to meet so many folks on that front. Certain things you can choose to do, certain things you can choose not to do, um, integrity is not one you can vary from. There's very few absolutes in this world. Integrity is one. There is no faster place to unwind, find your demise, than cutting corners on integrity. Um, there's lots of gray areas in terms of everything we do in terms of decisions. That's okay. You, get, you know, very few things are black and white in this world. But when it comes to integrity, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, you know what's law. Don't, don't do that. Speaking of kind of that decision gray area, um, a former in head of insurance for the Commonwealth of PA, who's, who's uh, a friend of mine, I was at uh, a function honoring him, and his, and his son got up there and talked about his dad. And he says, you know, I was, I was, I was talking to my dad one day, and uh, I was having a really tough time making a decision and I was weighing all the pros and cons, and I was going over and over and again. I just couldn't decide. And his dad went to him and says, you know, son, if it was me, I'd worry less time about making this decision because all things are gray. Make the best decision you can, but put more of your energies into making sure the decision you did make was the right one. And I think that as you get into business and leadership, everything you do is going to be gray. Do the best research you can, but don't get struck by paralysis because there can be many right answers and there can be many wrong answers. Put your energy either now in those business decisions or even your school decisions or your life decisions. Make your decisions as best you can, but then put your energy into making sure the decision you did make is the right one because ultimately execution and action orientation is usually what makes something either work or not work anyway. Uh, let's see, last thing here on this. Avoid the comfort zone. You're talking about investing already, but you know, there, um, if I've seen careers dismantle, it's really because of three things. Two we already talked about. Um, integrity, being nasty, you know, kind of leaving that wake of carnage. And the last one is people who may have 10 years of experience or 15 years of experience, but what they really have is four years of experience and that fifth year just happened 10 more times. Don't get stuck in the comfort zone. The world changes. Um, you know, so let's see, I've got Jack Welch, I've got Martin Luther King, you know, John F. Kennedy, I've got one more, one more comment here, right? So I've got, uh, there are risks and costs uh, to a program of action, but they are far less than the long range risks and costs of comfortable inaction. Um, you know, some of these sayings and some of these great quotes from these wonderful people, they last because they're true. Uh, don't get complacent. Don't get complacent what you're doing now. Don't get complacent in the future. 
All right, I'm pretty preachy here. Um, what, what, can I, what can I answer for you? Any, any questions in terms of things that are striking you? Okay, sure. Um, I really see the biggest opportunity where we become more knowledge brokers. So rather than just be lenders on the corporate side or whether than just being a transactor on the retail side, I'm seeing it because there's a whole bunch of folks out there as life gets more complicated and they get specialized in their own. The growth for us is where we're going to be able to be a knowledge broker and helping people meet life decisions or business decisions. Um, so for us and for me locally, 10% um, growth is really what I'm expecting and most of that is going to be coming not from just putting commodity credit out there, but because of, we're helping folks uh, craft solutions, whether they're selling a business and the key things to uh, be cognizant of or, or as people retire and get an IRA and how do they position their cash flow for retirement, we've got to be knowledge brokers. So it's less about a specific product, product or area than it is as we transform from transactors to knowledge brokers. Like I saw, another hand. I was going to ask, um, what would uh, you say your definition of success would be? I'll tell you what mine is, but uh, you know, each one of us should have a very unique one. For me, my definition of success is contributing uh, and being relevant every day and, and part of that relevance is helping uh, my customers and helping my associates and the people who report to me to be better tomorrow than they are today. Um, if you ever look at Maslow's hierarchy or some of the other things, you gotta make a decent amount of money. You have to make, have to make enough money that you know you can pay either your mortgage or your rent, make your car payment and put food on the table. Beyond that, uh, more money's nice, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, I, I like making a decent living, but it's not the end all be all. Um, you know, I've, I've seen lots of folks, and I've actually been in positions myself where you made a lot of money, but it just, it just didn't feel right. So, you know, I, that definition should be unique to each and every one of you. My, yeah. my nephew does, yeah. Yeah, where does he work? Houlihan Loki is an investment broker in, uh, or investment banking firm in Washington, D.C. Yeah, my 23-year-old sons are in graduate school, so hopefully they get a job someday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, can I give you a, I'm, I'm going to pass on for a couple more th things here. And it's really moving from individuals to roles as leaders. And just, I won't get into too much detail here, but things you should be cognizant of. As you, as you take on leadership, be cognizant that it becomes less about what you do than, than more about what the team does. Um, it becomes less about your effort. Effort's really important. I give folks a lot of, I give folks a second and third chance if they're trying to do the right thing and they're working hard. Even if they didn't get there, I'm good for that second, third chance. Um, so effort's important, but it's gonna show up more and more that it's less about effort than it is about results. As you become more and more of a leader, it becomes less about winning the battle and more about positioning and winning the war. And then forgive me for the, you know, the, the war analogy, but it's more about the big win than the little win. You gotta position for long term. It's less about actually what you've done and more about what, how you positioned yourself and your team for future success. Because once again, it's a long journey. So you have to be able to accomplish now, but also prepare for the future. You know, nothing's absolute um, except for your principles and integrity. So I talked about gray areas already. Understand the whole world is gray. And the whole world is gray except for your principles and, and, and the essence of what is true integrity. And I can have one definition on that and you another, but stay true to, your, stay true to those factors. Um, and embrace change. I asked one of my colleagues, I said I was talking today, I said, what's the key factor that you bring up to folks? And it's like, the people who we see succeed in my shop and, I, and elsewhere 
are people who embrace change. You know, as the old saying goes, the only constant in this, in this day and age is going to be change. So don't get comfortable, embrace change, be a leader on that change, whether it be within the college here or in your careers, but embrace it. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. Because the reality is, and here's another old saying, is that you can either you know, you know, get on the train or get run over, and, and there's a lot of truth to that. So you know, stay true to who you are, find that career that fits the essence of who you are and what you really like to do, and just realize the world's going to change, so kind of be adaptable. Um, I've got two grandkids as well, and my, my wife took me to see the, movie, the newer movie, Cinderella. It's probably about a year old at this point. But it struck me at the end, they, they uh, refer to this one line, and I think much of what I can tell you in terms of your careers, in terms of success, can be really wrapped up in one of the ending lines from Cinderella, which is, you know, have courage and be kind. I can't give you any better lessons than that, is to strive, have courage, and be kind. And you do those things, good things are going to happen to you. So those are my uh, long-winded words of wisdom. Um, I wish you nothing but success in your careers, whatever they, wherever they may take you, because you know, this is a chemical engineer standing in front of you who, is, who was a Federal Reserve guy and now a bank president. Who knows where life takes you? Learn, continue to learn, be flexible, stay true to who you are, and you'll just have wonderful, successful careers, and I wish you nothing but the best in your lives. So thank you for allowing me to come and talk to you today.